Happy Friday, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for our Friday Five Live conversation. And if you have any questions or comments during the session, just use your chat feature. And if you're comfortable sharing your messages with everybody, please select everyone there in the chat window, or it might say all panelists and attendees. And everybody will have access to the recording next week. If you're a GoToKnowledge member, it will be on your dashboard, and otherwise we will email it to you. And our host for our podcast today is Meg Foster. Meg Foster has spent 20 years in higher education focused on student success initiatives and working in areas such as orientation, faculty development, online learning, student leadership, and first year initiatives. And Meg, I will pass it over to you now. Thanks so much, Melissa. Well, happy Friday, everybody. I know um, we are so fortunate to have James and M.E. with us. Um, today, and I'm going to introduce them in just a second. I know for many of us, it's been maybe week one of class. Um, if you're James and you're on the quarter system, you've got till September and we're all envious um, uh, of, of his situation. But um, if it's been your first week of class or maybe your second week of class, we hope you're hanging in there. Um, we hope it's good to see students back on campus. We hope everybody's being safe. Um, I do just want to draw attention really quickly to some upcoming conversations we're having. Um, September 10th, we're really excited to have um, the team from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee come and join us to talk about their trauma-informed approach to this semester and this school year. Um, and they have lots of training materials that are readily available on their website. Um, so I think that's going to be a very interesting conversation. Um, and I'm really excited to uh, get to, to meet with them. Um, but this week, we're focusing on how we can get students into um, places like our tutoring centers, whether that's a virtual um, into or a physical into. Um, and so delighted to have with us um, M.E. McWilliams. Um, she is at Stephen F. Austin University in Nacogdoches, Texas, uh, where she co coordinates um, their academic assistance um, and resource center. And um, M.E. is just really a nationally recognized, I will say, I'm going to use the word expert, um, Emmy on, on tutoring services, support services, academic support services for our students. Um, she's also driving to Beaumont here in a little while to um, retrieve a grandchild. So we're gonna send good travel thoughts for her. Um, they may be experiencing some bad weather here shortly. So, and then we have James Kapinski with us as well um, from the West Coast um, at Chemekda Community College, I hope I, I didn't butcher that too badly, um, where he um, also coordinates um, tutoring resources as well. And, um, and it's amazing, I kind of met both of you initially through some listservs um, around um, learning assistance. And, and so it, it's great to have you both you know, here and get to see your faces. Um, and I'm so excited about uh, what you're gonna share. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so as always, I don't ever want to leave our, um, our guests stranded as far as what in the world am I going to talk about? So, um, you know, we're very conversational in our approach here at Friday Five Live. I've provided some um, questions to guide our conversation today, but um, if anybody in our listening audience has any questions at all, don't hesitate, put those in the chat, um, and I'll make sure that I weave those into our conversation. Emmy and James, you don't need to worry about that. That's um, my role. We're so excited to have so many of you um, here with us today. So. Um, and I'll just roll out these questions. And then if one really speaks to you, feel free, you know, jump in. Um, we're pretty casual in our approach. You know, as I mentioned, there's just been so much discussion this summer, I feel like about um, Jean Mandernack used the term that I think somebody at the Chronicle of Higher Ed um, coined around the COVID crash. Um, kind of versus this idea of um, summer, traditional summer learning loss, right? It's something different um, this year. And, and she shared with us some really sobering statistics that, um, you know, it's white affluent children are four to six months behind where they would normally be um, and students of color and students from low socioeconomic backgrounds are eight to 12 months behind. And so now we're seeing, you know, potentially those seniors or, um, I started teaching my FYE courses this week. A lot of people who took a year or more off, right? They've been out of school for the last 18 months um, are now returning. So are you seeing any of this? You know, James mentioned just coming off the summer semester, summer term, um, you know, are you beginning to see any of this in your own centers um, and with your staff as they're working with students? 
Um, well, Meg, I'm sorry, James, go ahead. No, go ahead. You go first. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this summer, I didn't really get to observe maybe what James did, because to be honest, we had just about run out of funding. And so we couldn't offer a lot of tutoring. So we had very little tutoring and we had very little response to the tutoring that we were offering. So I'm about to see what you're talking about here, this uh, tremendous loss of knowledge, as well as all of that affective learning that we hope they show up with a little, right? They may not have had um, the successes to build on in the last few years. And I am expecting a huge gap for which you know, we provided a lot of robust training to our tutors and growth mindset, you know, rebounding from setbacks, that kind of thing. Um, we'll be talking about stress management. We expect to see students who uh, have suffered from some large measure, measure of duress. So it won't just be the, uh, the knowledge gap. We'll be dealing with uh, a lot of other issues as well. James, what were you going to say? Oh, I would just echo a lot of what you're anticipating is sort of what I'm noticing in, in various doses throughout all of COVID, really. This, the entire, the last like year and a half, right? Students, it, it's, it's so different than the normal kind of summer melt or like the summer learning loss. Cause like loss kind of implies you have something, you lost it, you can find it again. Like if I misplace my glasses, I can look for them. And I'll probably find them. Maybe I'll step on them and break them, but I'll likely find them, right? And um, I think it's very different with COVID because we're dealing with all of those things you you just mentioned that are creating additional barriers to the point where some students, it's not even an issue of sitting down with them in a tutoring session and refreshing some prior knowledge and reactivating those kind of that those study habits. They may not have them. They, it's just missing and it's a much further gap to cross. Like we have students who it's always, you know, it, it digitally when we're working hybrid like this, it's, it's always like a, a struggle to first diagnose what's happening. Is the student struggling with the academics or do they just have unreliable internet access at home? So they missed half of their lectures and there's this other big sort of problem, or they don't know how to take notes in a digital space because they've been handwriting their whole life. And suddenly now there's this new thing I have to learn. And like, so overcoming lots of new barriers that students didn't, that, that weren't as prevalent before. Students always come into our centers with more than just academic needs, but I think it's been definitely pronounced um, throughout the pandemic. And when they come back, we're going to have to play a lot of catch up. Mm -hmm. That was really well said. I, I like the way that you uh, worded that, uh, James, and talking about the barriers. I mean, we like to think that we are the people who know how to identify what those obstacles to learning are. And in the past, we've had kind of a, a menu of what those options might be. Uh -huh. But like James is saying, it's, it's really so off uh, the charts right now. Uh, we don't know if the gap is because of um, uh, income struggles that the family has had, or as you said, a lack of internet access. That is a, has been a, a huge thing for these students. And so... Um, we really have our work cut out for us. It's made us feel excited about being back because we, we know we have a mission. And uh, I am seeing that these students are feeling very excited about, well, what is this tutoring center? I heard about it and I'm seeing happy faces. Uh, so at least we'll begin with that. And we'll, we will take uh, some time once they come in to identify what those obstacles are. But I'm just really thrilled right now to see smiles. <laughs> I think there's a, a lot of us who are like, oh, wait, there's students here again. Like, it's so amazing how re-energizing um, that is, that um, this being at a distance, um, at least in, in our uh, community college system here, um, has just, uh, I, I don't think I really realized how mentally draining, right, um, that was until we could actually see the, their real genuine smiles, um, as my kids say, IRL, right, in real life. So um, that that is certainly important. But And, and James, I really appreciate how you're talking about you know, these barriers that are new barriers. Um, because, and I think we really need to educate ourselves about um, the fact that 
I, uh, we had a great discussion two weeks ago with a panel of six students from across the US talking about kind of their concerns as they started out um, this fall. And one of the things that they said was they really were um, displeased with language about, oh, well, we're returning to normal. Um, because in, in using that language, that means we sort of dismiss everything that they've been through. Um, and our students are in such different places now, um, mentally, I think, and um, academically, that we need to honor that. And so, um, and that requires a whole new level of training, you know, as, as the mm -hmm. two of you have talked about um, with your staff, that it's, it's not enough to, we're not doing the training that we would have done three years ago, because that isn't relevant um, as much to these students who um, are coming to us. So, and Dwayne, thank you for your um, comment of um, using the language of establishing and navigating a new normal. Um, I've seen a lot of different um, takes on how we can talk about this, um, this new, this place we're transitioning into um, as well. So if you do have positive language to use around that, that can help us frame that, um, I think, please share it in the chat. That would be wonderful. And before we move, I'll just add to that, like on this idea of return to normal, we talked a lot about the barriers, but I think it's important to acknowledge that there are, there's a, a segment of students who are doing better right now, mm. who really respond to online learning and they enjoy that flexibility in their life and the, and being able to chat with a tutor from the comfort of their home. And like, so we're trying not to lose sight of that and retain as much as we can of sort of this hybrid mentality. And I think that's a, that's, that's something a lot of institutions I would hope are doing is thinking about what normal could look like in a you know, quote new normal, right. And, mm -hmm. and retaining what works for, for certain students. Well, and that's, I'd be curious to find out from both of you as you're shaping what tutoring services will look like for the, for this mm -hmm. next term, is it, and I've seen a wide variety of things, right. Um, you know, institutions where they're like, nope, we've, we've, we're back in person, everything is in person. Um, I've also seen a lot of pushback from students on that. You know, they've had 18 months of, I can do tutoring in my pajamas in my living room, like, um, and I don't have to travel an hour to come to campus to, to get tutored. So curious about what each of you um, are doing. Are you having hybrid kind of what will that look like? Well, for us, uh, we are that university where the president said, uh, we are returning to, um, I'm not sure you use the word normal, but previous operations, meaning full occupancy, face masks are optional, social distancing is optional. These things are encouraged, but they're optional. But we're, our hands are tied here because we're a state university and our governor has mandated that it, that it be this way. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm seeing is uh, certainly not normal. Uh, I'm never going to probably see that again. I'm seeing a, a mix right now of what people want. There is a, a sector of faculty and staff and students who are masked up and are really concerned about being back and being around people who aren't concerned. <laughs> and so um, there's a lot of tension about what that means. Um, the people who are not distancing and not wearing masks. I don't think that they're reckless. I think that they're, they're just uh, want some freedom. And uh, most of us have gotten vaccinated, right? But we can't require the vaccination. We can only encourage it here. Some schools are able to require it. I think that would be a game changer. But I, I could see the reality of all of this because on, my, on, the, on the first day that we had our really big training, there was a young man who sat up front and uh, I was very close to him while presenting and found out the next day that he had COVID and he was hospitalized. So he, he, he was not asymptomatic. So it's still a very real thing down here. What, what's life like for you up there, James? Um, yeah. So we're looking ahead to fall. In theory, we're back on campus with everything open with masks because our governor has mandated that again. Um, but things you know, a month ago, if you had asked me this, we would have been back on campus with no masks. So the so the what's happening at the state level is definitely impacting what the college, how the college is responding. Um, so I don't, with our fall term starting a few weeks out, 
and we're in the middle of a Delta surge right now, there could be lockdowns. There could like, we're as an institution, I think a lot of departments are trying to plan for multiple scenarios because we don't know what it's going to look like. Um, we do not have a vaccine mandate, um, much like Emmy's um, institution, but that is something that there's not, the governor's not standing in the way of those sorts of things. The uh, universities in Oregon all have vaccine requirements. One community college currently does, some others are talking about it. Um, so there's, things are constantly shifting as people are figuring out kind of how this is going to look. But in terms of our offerings, we're trying to make sure we're prepared for any situation. But right now our plan is it, we're back on campus doing some limited face-to-face -face tutoring for the students who are on campus, but then also we're, Chemeketa is still having a ton of remote classes. We know some students are still going to prefer that, um, whether it's for health and safety or because of just their learning and kind of they prefer that modality. So we're definitely offering tons of, we're trying to offer as much Zoom tutoring as we can too, we're trying to do a little of both. And I'd love to see that persist long after COVID is more under control and less of a threat. Like, I think that's a good thing for, for certain students. I agree with you. I love that flexibility. And I have seen that section, as you said, who, who, who uh, are doing better because of the flexibility and, uh, and being able to learn where they want to learn and actually being able to remove themselves from distractions that often exist when you're on campus and uh, interacting with a lot of students. And yet, of course, that's very much the college experience. But I was teaching a um, group of high risk students in a first year experience course, and um, they were at home for that bridge program that summer. And I found that they were doing really well. I was surprised, but they were at home. They were in a comfort zone. And um, the, the distractions for those students in a first year experience summer course is usually high. We, ha we have a lot of problem with, you know, uh, late night activities, shall we say. And so a lot of distractions from the learning, but not so much that summer. And I, I also enjoyed it as a teacher. But right now, I mean, James and I, our, our venues right now are so different because mine is mostly all in person. You know, we're, we're doing all of the services that we offer in person. We are offering via Zoom, but this is this is very much an attempt here to um, to recreate what we had before. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. That's it's so intriguing, and and people have been fantastic putting in the chat kind of what their various institutional approaches are, um, you know, and we're seeing. Uh, please continue to, to share that with us. I know um, we're all kind of in different places, but sometimes it's great to see similarities, um, to know that you're not alone. Um, and I do feel, you know, we're in, in Virginia, our governor has mandated vaccinations for all state employees. So um, have to do that. And we must all be masked in the community college system. So um, just to get a different perspective um, on how, how things can go. Well, are there particular, so to, to kind of weave back into our, our questions here, um, particular academic areas that, you know, you, your, your institutions are identifying as, or your faculty are coming to you and saying, you know, we're concerned um, that these are the places we're really going to need additional support this year. And are there any things, any measures you're taking, I'm thinking like supplemental instruction or things like that, um, to kind of make sure that those particular classes um, get addressed. I mean, I know you do some work with kind of, uh, I got an email this morning at 5 a.m. from Emmy. Um, she was <laughs> responding to a national, to a listserv. Um, oh. It was great information. <laughs> yes, 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 I, I did do like, that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just always hope people turn off their notifications at night. I get up really early, so yeah, I did. Um, I, I did it. respond. Um, so, well, again, Meg, what, what was your uh, your question yeah. there? So the question there is like, what? where are the academic areas that you're like? Oh, okay, okay right. And you mentioned supplemental. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Thank um, you. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, uh, about I'd say 70 percent of what we do is SI. And uh, it's always been a huge su success for us because, you know, you have this wonderful marriage between the faculty member and the SI leader that the professor has chosen. And so the professor is really invested in success by making that selection. 
And, uh, and then the two talking a bit about how the SI groups might go so that the students might be best prepared for papers and tests. And so our SIs uh, survived the, have survived the ongoing pandemic um, pretty well. Uh, we're going, all of our, cl our uh, classrooms that we use for our SI groups are set up for hybrid so that we can serve Zoom clients in sync with the in-person clients. And uh, that, I wondered how that would go. We did do a few SI groups this week and it seemed like now our SI leaders have some level of comfort with that. With like, yeah, I always had some Zoom clients and I have these people in person and I was managing the equipment and working to keep both engaged. But, you know, I've tried to do this myself and it's really hard to keep all parties engaged, but it seems that our tutors are very flexible. And so yes, uh, SI will be um, our premier service as we move forward. What were you thinking, James? Um, so yeah, in response to the, the question of academic areas that I think will need additional support, I mean, the quick answer is like all of them, but the more, um, the more direct answer, I think, um, I think I have it lucky. I am the the writing tutor supervisor. Our our tutoring and study skills center has kind of uh, discipline specific um, specialists who are supervising different disciplines, and then we have one coordinator who's a kind of above everything, managing the space, and uh, and I'm in charge of the writing stuff. And I think from what so it's not my area of expertise, so I can't say for sure, but I I have this gut suspicion that STEM is going to be a more difficult transition, simply because thinking of what we talked about earlier, those barriers, those new barriers that are cropping up, I feel like most students going into a writing course understand that Microsoft Word is going to be a thing, right? Maybe there, you know, there's some returning adult students or some students of a low SES background who maybe didn't have access to computers at home. There's, there's still, that's not a given, but for the most part, like they know there that technology didn't change that much, but the students working on, let's say math, for example, who are used to pulling out their graph paper because that's their, you know, instructor's preferred modality suddenly have to learn a digital tool to do all of their graphs. And like, there's these other technology barriers that are cropping up, I think in STEM that aren't cropping up in the same way in writing. Um, so getting students, you know, you know, dealing with those kind of that, that kind of gap that has developed as they've been struggling with the technology and ended up a week behind by the time they figured it out. That's right. a big deal. And then also, um, if we're thinking of the STEM field, there's a lot of, you know, we've gradually been transitioning back lab classes, but there are some that are still remote and they're doing sort of these theoretical labs instead of hands-on labs. And like some, some students are really going to need a lot of extra guidance and coaching on how to navigate those physical spaces and how, how to, you know, do a lab environment because they've never done it before. It's brand new. And by now they normally would have been in two or three lab classes and suddenly this yeah. is their first one. And so we have to kind of play catch up. Um, mm -hmm. So as far as how we're supporting that, um, we don't have uh, SI at Chemeketa. Um, there is some embedded tutoring that's being piloted where students specifically in STEM in the math courses where some um, tutors are kind of sitting in the classes and kind of being involved during lecture, being able to um, circulate the room and kind of support students while the class is actively happening, especially when there's group activities going on. And then that, that tutor also kind of, those students have kind of a direct channel to be able to book with that tutor. Since they're sitting in the class, they've seen the material, they kind of are the point person who knows exactly what that student is working on and what they're struggling with. Um, so that's, that's something that's kind of in pilot form. I'd love to see that expand more. I'd love to see it in writing. We've done that in the past, but never in a big way. Um, so that's, that's our big push for some more exciting services is things like getting a tutor into the classroom to kind of provide some, some support there. The research is saying that embedded tutoring models, whether it's SI or what, or what you're doing, we, we do have that kind of, it's in, an interesting parallel. We're also in writing doing an embedded tutor. Uh, we're not calling it SI because it doesn't operate like that, but uh, any, any tutoring model that involves an embedded tutor uh, the research says uh, is likely to survive the uh, pandemic best or any other kind of crises. I will say that probably I did beef up the SI a lot because 
if I were just doing the walk-in tables right now, I'd be nervous. I need those professors pushing it. Um, I, I mean, right now, uh, we have we, we have to be big, big on the marketing. And I can't be everywhere, but that student is in class, you know? And uh, and so, yes, the embedded model as well, I'm hoping will be, will be the thing that we will also need to put our attention to. Interesting. And thanks for bringing up that research, too, because I know um, uh, as we're trying to make the case right for these continued services or expansion of services at institutions and some folks have chatted in that, they, that they've seen, you know, cuts in their staffing or um, not having the same sort of budget. And you mentioned, you know, not being able to provide tutoring as much this summer because of um, not having that kind of budget um, that, that needs to be. Maybe maybe we should jump to that. That's kind of my last question, um, but maybe that's a, a good next point. For our institutions that are looking to expand services or resources, um, any clever, if you can get out your magic wands now, please, and wave them for us and solve these problems. Um, but, but any things that you're seeing that are really um, helpful um, to institutions that are looking to um, expand who they've got there available to provide these supports um, for our students. That's that's tough. Like um, yes. we we are um, especially on the you know expanding staff um, is definitely difficult right now. Even if we had an unlimited piggy bank, recruitment has been a big challenge for for us during the pandemic. Um, so as part of our kind of start of term marketing, we'd often kind of go into classes and do these little five minute class visits where we hand out some brochures, talk about the services. I love to send tutors rather than myself, but you know, depending on scheduling, sometimes I go, but I love to you know, have them see a real tutor and that this is a student you can relate to and they invite you to come. And during that though, during those class visits, we're often like given that quick pitch of like, you can also work for us, you know, and like just getting that in front of as many or, you know, having that message received in dozens and dozens of classes um, brings in applications. We also, you know, had, we tabled at like the, the career fair kind of thing on campus mm. where students are learning about campus jobs. And, you know, there was all these in-person things, these kind of events and different way mechanisms we had. And now we're relying on like, okay, we're going to send out this email that few few people are going to click on. Um, so it's been tough getting those messages in front of people's eyeballs. But then I think the big challenge we're having even now as we're preparing to go back is going to be the, I mean, in Oregon, at least there's a, there's a labor shortage for kind of entry level unskilled positions, especially like fast food. And that, like, I, I went to Taco Bell recently, not proud of eating at Taco Bell, but you know, <laughs> it's delicious. And, um, uh, there's no shame right on the like they had <laughs> plastered everywhere like now hiring 14 25 an hour like on every like signage everywhere it was even on my little bag that a big sticker nice and bold so that I could see we'll hire you like please work here we'll pay you a lot more than the tutoring center will pay you is basically what that message was telling me and that's that's where I think some of our recruitment challenges are coming from too and so for for me my strategy I don't I hope it will work, but the best we can do, I think, is emphasize fringe benefits, like the ability to conveniently schedule some shifts between your classes so that you don't have to go drive to Taco Bell and then come back to class, right. you know, or come back to campus. Like you can just kind of walk right down the hall, clock into work and start working. And kind of the, we often also, if it's a slow day, we, we know that these are students. So we allow them to sort of you know, do homework if there's downtime, you know, and get some of their studying done. We try to talk up the CRLA training that we do and some of the, the skills that you gain through it, like, you know, active listening, appreciative inquiry. Those are things that employers want. So we try to kind of highlight those other, other things you'll gain from the position that aren't monetary, because frankly, that's our biggest barrier is. I could make more money elsewhere. So why would I work here? Right. There's, there's well, I would, I, would, I would echo uh, much of what James said, but for me, uh, my first thought goes to the fact that I lost a program. So the ARC is divided into four programs and they're all handling the same tutoring modalities, but they are divided according to subject. 
So math and business, and we had liberal arts, that was a program. And then we had writing, et cetera, and science. Well, we had a financial crisis here. And um, so I had someone leave and they were not replaced. And that happened a lot across campus that uh, faculty and staff left and they were not replaced. So we moved to three programs and I created support for those three program directors by creating this tier of leadership called um, program assistants. So we call them PAs. And so it's basically almost like having um, um, their own GA. Uh, it's someone who can help with the tracking and a lot of the data entry, et cetera. And then we had yet another tier of team leaders so that each program director would have maybe four or five tutors who were uh, helping with the training in small groups. Our tutors were saying this year that while we do some things in, in large, arc-wide, they wanted more training in small groups. And so these program assistants and the team leaders are all tutors uh, doing these jobs, usually in addition to tutoring. But I had to get clever about how I could get support for these program directors or they were going to really burn out fast with the loss of this fourth program. So it, the situation has required some innovation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's some great chat going on about other things institutions are looking at doing, um, you know, reminding folks how good this looks on a resume. I think James mentioned sort of the skills. And um, James, we've had a question, I'll hold on till the end, but um, about how tutors receive CRLA. Um, certification, it sounds like, from an institution that's just kind of gotten a tutoring center um, up off the ground. So um, using student ambassadors as tutors, you know, I think um, in my experience, we would often try to grab work study students um, as well, sort of have people, you know, serving in multiple kinds of roles um, at, our, at our institution too. Um, that's, and, and Mary mentioned that they're using CARES Act money um, to be able to fund some of their positions. So I, you know, I, I know I, I kind of have this sense that I'm, we're still, I think in higher ed, what, 450,000 positions down from where we were um, at the start of the pandemic. So um, if my, my numbers from the Chronicle are correct. So, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of rebuilding. I think institutions do have these resources, financial, um, that we at least get, hope we get to hold on to for a year or two. Um, so I, I am also talking with a lot of folks who are making sure that they're documenting everything this year, right? So that we can make the case that these are, are, are programs that we need to continue at our institutions. Um, well, thank you for those. I know that's, that's the hard question. How, how do we find folks? How do we recruit them? Um, how do we, you know, get them trained? Uh, you guys have fantastic training programs, but um, then, and how do we find creative ways to find new, hire new people? Um, and I know at our two-year institutions, James, I don't know about your experience, but in mine, often we just don't hold on to the students for very long. You know, by the time you identify that they're going to be a wonderful tutor, you only get them for two semesters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's always um, such a shame. Um, and a, But also a good point to, um, uh, I've seen some cool collaborations between two and four-year institutions to kind of um, make sure people know about the positions that are available at both of them, kind of in regions. Well, I guess our, our we, get, we have um, a, about 12 more minutes and I wanna make sure we get to this question because I think this is gonna be um, a, a great conversation here. Talking about how your learning support centers are, are planning to encourage students to use their resources. You know, especially, I mean, Emmy, you're getting to see people's smiling faces in real life. Um, and I know I, I love when I'm with my students and I can metaphorically, I would never actually do this, grab them by the ear right, and, and drag them into the tutoring center and say, this is a resource you need to be familiar with. Um, and for those of us who are gonna be more online, what kind of recommendations do you have for this year to really help our students understand these resources exist, we're here to help you, we have flexible options for you, um, and you need, 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 need to use them. Again, pull out those magic wands for us. <laughs> well, my magic wand may be kind of broken. Uh, my bag of tricks are empty, but um, 
I would say that, uh, again, because I was both for many years the director of this tutoring center, but also teaching the first year experience course on the side, it gave me an opportunity to talk to that group of students in my class about the tutoring center. So I knew that all of them knew about the ARC. That's the name of our tutoring center. They knew. And I had taken the time to look up their schedules and actually pair everything that we offered that matched up with courses they were taking. So they had the information and yet they weren't going to the ARC. And so closer to the end of the semester, I decided to poll them and say, well, why, why, why didn't you come? Why didn't you try it? Because so many of them could see then, okay, you know, the hole was still there. They were still drowning. It wasn't getting any better and they might not be back. I mean, the stakes were so high that, they, that these were students on suspension and so forth. And so why didn't they even try? And so many of them said, I just didn't know what to expect. Hmm. Yet I had tried to explain, I mean, we have little vids and, you know, cute little things that tutors have made. I was sensitive to that, but I didn't realize the depth of it. I don't know if that increased because of COVID, more duress about the unexpected. One student said, you know, I'm already so depressed and frustrated. I don't want to take a chance that that's how I'm going to feel when I get to the art. And I have had such a successful campaign normalizing art all these years all these years, we didn't have the stigma that some, some people uh, work so hard against universities, but I am seeing something new here, that, that this stigma uh, seems to have, have, have returned somewhat hand in hand with students affected by the pandemic. So we're still working on, let us show you what it's like here. So we're offering to first year experience courses right now, Zoom tours. So you're in class and here we are in the arc and we're gonna walk you around and, trying to show them what it looks like and reduce that fear. That's interesting that, that there's been this kind of post-pandemic, well, we're not post-pandemic, but whatever we are now, um, <laughs> the stigma, right, that you had not had before and now you're seeing this shift and that, mm -hmm. but I love the idea of is, let us show it, let us, we're going to strip down the, there's no question about what this experience will be like or where you're going to go or how it will work kind of like how I have to deal with my middle schoolers, right? We're going to walk in. This is where you're going to leave your stuff. Like, it will be okay. Uh, let's walk you through that. I, I really love that. Um, and for institutions, you could even, you know, record it. I mean, I think live is fantastic, but if you needed to, um, you could record those. Um, we've had some success at Piedmont with, a, we did a 10-minute podcast on success resources, and we actually found students who listened to it used academic coaching because it wasn't, they could hear a voice and the voice sounded kind, right? And and I know that sounds silly, but it was like, well, you're not scary people. Um, I can go work with you and this will be okay. Um, so I love that. James, what, what are you guys gonna do at your institution? Yeah, um, we kind of look at it through a similar lens. And I think you're right that it's gonna be, it's going to be even harder next fall because everything's new and scary, not just the tutoring center. Some of right. ours, especially at a two-year institution like ours, some of, a big chunk of our students have never even set foot on campus at this point. Some of them, you know, we've got new students who have been here with us for a year and a half exclusively remote. Um, so yeah, it is about finding ways to create a low stakes entry point. Like, like I said, we do those class visits when we're in, you know, on a face-to-face -face term, we'll We'll get students into the classroom to just pitch the services. And I, the reason I like to send a student instead of me is, is it does seem, you know, easier to just talk to a peer. And like that person doesn't look as scary as the person who is kind of, you know, wearing a tie and has like the official name tag and everything. Um, so, you know, that I think is a big thing. And then um, we do things like open houses where um, especially you know, a, a kind of fall kickoff when all the students come back, there's these events where they get to explore different spaces. And we try to make that as fun as possible instead of just pitching our services to you. Like we had like a carnival theme one year where there was a little kind of, they could spin this wheel and kind of either win prizes or sometimes we'd force them to like answer a question, like an academic question or something. Um, and some other little games, I don't remember all of what was there, but we had different stations set up. Um, and so trying to do things like that, where it's not about like, let me tell you why you need writing support. It's more just like, mm -hmm. come in, take a look around. It's okay here. We don't bite. 
Um, and one thing we really used to kind of also do during those class visit pitches, part of the script was really emphasizing the value of our space as a study zone, because we're fortunate to have a fairly large um, tutoring and study skills center to, um, to the point where students can stick around if they're not working with a tutor. And they can come there even before their first appointment and just sort of work for a couple hours and use our computers and just sort of use it as this study space. We have, you know, we talk about, there's also this textbook library next year, and we've got some calculators you can borrow, like making just those, those nice, like open invitations to like, low stakes, you don't even got to talk to a human the first time you come in, just waltz to the door, sit down, chill, do what you want to do. Um, I don't, I don't think we're going to be that wide open flinging the doors for fall term, just thinking about the Delta variant surging here and everything, uh, where we're definitely sticking to more a kind of timed appointments where we can kind of control the number of people and the flow of the space a little more. We used to do a lot more just drop in kind of tutoring as well. Um, so I think pre and post COVID is going to look a lot, a little different, but we still need to think of ways to make it less scary to make low stakes entry points an option, whether that's, you know, those just kind of those fun check us out kind of things. Um, we used to also, I guess, another thing with our large space, we can accommodate classes, which has been huge. If you have a space big enough for it, invite instructors to come and bring their class for the day. Mm -hmm. And just that gets students in there and even if they're not working with a tutor, they feel comfortable because they've been there before and they know someone's name, you know, that they can talk to. Um, so those sorts of things, I think, is what we're going to need to need to be working towards. Yeah. There's been some great um, chat as well. Thank you both for for attempting to pull out your magic wands here. But, um, you know, the idea of um, incentivizing like giveaways, right, get your swag. Um, it's amazing to me. I think students have really missed the swag um, in in this last year and so they'll do anything um you know okay i'll come in and oh i get a water bottle or a pen or i mean i don't know that it has to be fancy um anymore yeah. we uh, but, our most popular item has previously granted this is pre-covid was these little sticky notes that just had our logo on like a little flip book kind of thing with sticky notes in it and they're they're not that expensive to get made up like right. people loved it <laughs> right isn't that amazing? They're like, great, awesome. If it's sticky notes, we will make sure we have sticky notes. Um, <laughs> um, you know, other folks are talking about how their orientation space provides an opportunity to introduce students to um, tutoring resources. And Stephen has shared that they've been creating example videos that faculty can share, um, uh, kind of getting them comfortable to the students comfortable um, to ask questions because they already sort of know them, right? You've already met. Um, so sort of what Emmy was was talking about as well. So um, and, and I love hearing um, about these different creative ideas, trying to read through all of our chat. Um, lots of ideas of embedding students. Stigmatize um, the idea of tutoring, because I do think that we're just going to see across the board you know, it's it just we had the year that we had, right? I mean, it, it just it was what it was. And we all made the best of it. Um, and um, as, but there's some real um, as barriers, as I think James has used that word, um, that students really need to help. And I, I'm concerned that some of my students don't even seem to be aware of the fact that they're going to need that support, if that makes sense, um, in, in ways I've not seen before. Um, you know, before it was, oh, well, you know, maybe I don't have the strongest math foundation, or I'm overwhelmed about taking anatomy and physiology with a lab. Um, but having not been in a math class now for a year, students just seem even more disconnected from what their academic strengths are. And Emmy, I think you kind of kicked us off with this idea um, that, that students are sort of disassociated from who they are as learners um, in a way, given this year. Any, we have about, oh, only one more minute, but any last parting words of advice um, for us? I, I know we didn't get a chance to talk about our staff who, bless their hearts, I know we're just kind of beat up from, um, from all that we've continued to support students. So please do take care of yourselves as best you can. Um, you know, it's hard to help our students when we ourselves are just absolutely worn out. And I know somebody mentioned that in our chat, but any last words of, of parting wisdom? I would just uh, tag on to that. 
we talked about the duress of our students. Of course, our tutors are students, so uh, they're under duress. And then my professional staff have been under extreme duress. Uh, some of them have particular issues at home that make them hypersensitive to um, their safety during this pandemic. And so I have to be sensitive to that. And I can see that many of them, um, they need some self-care. So what I, I did was I told them, I checked with HR first to see if I could, but I've told them that when needed, you know, on occasion, they may work remotely. So it's not telecommuting. We don't need to do any paperwork. It's they just need my approval. And so some of them will ask, hey, you know, could I work from home this afternoon? And I think that's been a game changer just to have that flexibility, just to, they're still working, they're at home and, uh, you know, they can have a cup of tea or, or be next to their cat. And so I'm trying to be better as um, a boss um, regarding self-care. That's been on my mind. So. Thank you, Emily. One words, James, any? Yeah, I, I would echo that the self-care is very important. We're trying to be as flexible as possible with scheduling, recognizing that our tutors have been through a lot. And, you know, I've gotten feedback from some of them that they're also not understandably not comfortable doing a bunch of in-person shifts when they know the, the current policy is, is that we're not requiring vaccinations on our campus. Some of our tutors are very aware of that. They're hesitant. And I really we're trying to work around that as much as we can and accommodate everyone so they can be safe and healthy at work. Um, but it's tough when you have these competing priorities of, of wanting to honor that while also the institution and the, the state at the state level, things are trying to be more open and, and we, we need our physical centers to be there for students who are having all of those barriers in the digital world. We need to kind of think about how we can support them. So there's this constant tension and just making sure that tutors, student tutors are not caught up in the middle of it. And we could recognize the need, their need for self-care um, and the needs of the students we serve. I would, I guess my parting thought would be, I think it was your next podcast or maybe two more out or something. You have that one on trauma informed practices. Um, That's next. Month, I will definitely be listening to that. That is, I mean, we need to recognize that everyone coming back to campus has been through a year and a half of this massive worldwide traumatic event <laughs> and figuring out ways to be sensitive to that it's really uh, important i think that's well thank you that's a beautiful segue james um to um to our next conversation yes please join us september the 10th we're going to talk with the university of wisconsin milwaukee's team who's taken the trauma they've done i mean it's incredible they've done all this research about their own faculty, staff, and student needs, and um, as well as the community that they exist in. And so um, I'm anxious to learn from them because um, I think that's a really important way that we acknowledge this year um, that's gonna be different than, than last year, certainly, and different than the one to come. So thank you all so much for your time and your thoughts and your compassion. And um, we just really, really appreciate it. I know um, it was wonderful to hear from so many of our audience members with um, their thoughts and their questions. I, I think I, I always wanna create a space where we can kind of share our, our, our best ideas and maybe it sparks something. Um, but also a space where we can make sure that we're not alone in these things that we, um, these challenges we experience uh, working with our students. So thank you, Emily and James, for your time um, on this Friday. Happy Friday, everybody. I hope no matter where you are, you get a chance to rest and renew this weekend, uh, whether that's driving to get a grandchild or um, just having a moment outside um, in nature. So everybody take care, and I hope to see you um, on September the 10th. Um, for our next Friday Five Live. Thank you guys.